Hello world, welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Ayal Shai. My guest today is Sasha Green. Hi Sasha. Hi there. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to hear from you about an idea that's been helping you live well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I guess my concept is something that was explored a bit by one of your previous podcast hosts, Martin Ellis, podcast guest, um, about this concept of saying no, you know, because it's something that's been quite instrumental in my life and setting up my life as I want, want it to. So that's really what I want to explore. Nice. Um, yeah, so I'd love for you to maybe pick a time or a snapshot where this is most relevant to you in your life, where you have um, a light bulb moment or a realization that makes you think of it. Uh, what would that be? Um, I think it came over a long period of time, actually. I mean, I, I, as a child, I was quite, quite a happy child, you know, not really thinking too much about life and existence. And then in my teens, I was quite badly bullied at school um, to the point where I was surprised when people wanted to make friends with me or, you know, always suspicious of their motives. And as a result of that, it had quite an impact on my life. So I always tried as hard as I could to be liked, you know, so I would do things for other people that I didn't really want to do. You know, I would go places, you know, go to parties that I didn't really want to go to just to try and be this person you know, to, even when I met nice people, you know, I'd, I'd want to do, I'd put myself out too much to do stuff. And it all came to a head um, in about 2015. I overstretched myself. So I was doing a lot of work, you know, helping in the community, volunteering, doing stuff, and also a lot of stresses at work. And I ended up with flu. I was off work for four weeks. And then afterwards, I had quite bad post-viral fatigue. So if there are any of your listeners that are suffering from long COVID, you know, they'll know the symptoms that are really bad fatigue, not being able to do anything. So for about 18 months, I was literally just had the energy to go to work and come back and collapse on the sofa. You know, so this sort of forced this kind of idea because I had to say no to a lot of things, you know, because obviously you've got to keep earning money. You've I had to try and keep my job and and yeah, I think in those days this concept of mental health, you know, these days I might have just said, Oh look, I need a sabbatical, I need a month off just to relax and or you know, even I need to take long, long sick pay or, you know, some kind of phase return to work. But that sort of stuff didn't really exist back then and mm. and so yeah, that it that was what the real catalyst of this because I was forced to say no to a lot of things. Um, that I just physically didn't have the energy to, to do. Hmm. And so from that um, sort of low point up until then, at least if look through the paradigm of, you know, being productive, which is something that we hear a lot, um, it sounds like today you might appreciate in a different way, like maybe that was um, somehow a, a good thing, right? Um, I think it was a very difficult time of my life, you know, like I mm. lost a lot of friends, like people would be like, oh, come for dinner, you know, and then I'd be like, well, I can't come for dinner, you know, and they'd be like, oh, but, you know, they, it would sort of be like, you know, you, you don't like me or, you know, and after a while, like people will keep on inviting you, but after a while, the invitations just stopped coming. You know, I, I really found out who my real friends were because you know, my real friends were willing to work around stuff. So they'd be like, oh, come for lunch or, you know, so you're not so tired or I'll come to your house or, you know, things that would, would help me work with my temporary disability that I had. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they were quite few and far between. A lot of people just couldn't understand this sort of, and didn't really take the time. I mean, it's not necessarily their fault because people have busy lives and they have their own stresses and, and this kind of stuff. So you know, it's, but yeah, they didn't take the time to really understand what was going on and, and to try to accommodate what I needed. So yeah, in the end, I had to say no to a lot of things. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I may have misunderstood, but so um, you're basically saying that 
um, the, the saying no um, could be a good thing, but you were put in a situation where you ha- you had to say no and then um, it proved to be tough because not a lot of people are understanding. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, no, um, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that out of every bad situation comes some good stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, it started me, but that's what really started me on this journey of thinking, well, how do I want to set up my life? And, you know, what is really important and who is really important? You know, and and are things like social media, are they important? You know, keeping up with people on Facebook that I don't really know, you know, and haven't met mm-hmm. for years. And is this is this time really important? So the, this was the catalyst, I guess, if you're, if you're looking for a catalyst in terms of my thinking about this. Um, when, you know, how do you, what do I say yes to and what do I say no, especially when you have limited resources, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, so I'm eager to know what are some of the things that made the cut, some of the things that were left out and uh, <laughs> what some of the criteria are. Well, there were kind of two, I mean, I guess I had two cuts really because the first was the cut I had to make when I was ill. And then the second, you know, lockdown came um, in 2020. And this, again, was a big catalyst for me because um, it, it there were things that I couldn't, they just suddenly stopped. And in some ways, it was actually a relief. Like, I remember when lockdown came, you know, I realized that things must be bad because the thought of spending six weeks in the house and not having to go out and not having to do anything was actually a relief, you know, <laughs> because I was like, oh, finally, I get a rest. So... But I think, yeah, like I say, you know, I realized actually I'd been trying to keep in touch with a lot of people that actually maybe weren't you know, giving, it sounds quite selfish, but, you know, weren't giving me anything in my life, you know, which I think is important because any relationship has to be a two-way, a two-way, a two-way thing. You know, it's got to, there's got to be some give and take, otherwise... You know, I always say if you're just giving to somebody, that's fine, but that's charity. You know, it's almost like mm-hmm. you give your money to a charity. You can you can give your time to to someone that needs help or, you know, without any expectation of getting anything back. But that's that's not a relationship, that's not a friendship. That's that's in a way giving your money to giving your time to charity. Um so it, for me it's a totally different thing. And actually that's one of the things that has been quite an epiphany for me that there are some relationships which are two way, you know, they're very specifically beneficial to both people. And then how do I separate out that feeling of, oh, yes, I can give my time to help this person, but I'm not going to get anything back. So therefore, I shouldn't be expecting it. So I put them in two different buckets. And mm-hmm. that's been very helpful in a way that to actually do that mental separation because it makes me feel less guilty. You know, if something's in the charity bucket, it makes me feel less guilty about saying no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally I totally see that being the case that we need reciprocal relationships, right? Where the where the people trying to benefit one another is is mutual. Otherwise it's it's it is draining and it's not a, that easy, I think, to get to that place in this day and age. Um, there is a lot of kind of utility thinking behind everything. And we've been trained to think in this way, I think, because of how we do business and other things. And um, I've been thinking a lot about trying to create those relationships and I've been doing it. And I've just recently been kind of almost disillusioned with the more online communities actually realizing that yeah they they are in some way for example twitter i mean it's the only one that i really do but it's really designed in a way where the where the actual reciprocity is like so minimal it's like really at the level of the like most of the time you know and it's like you dig a bit deeper not a whole lot in there right um yeah, so what uh, did you come up with uh, new strategies or, or tactics to or some thoughts not not to make it this whole thing like extremely cerebral or anything, but 
so, some um, actions that can be taken to create more of the friendships that are mutual? I think it's interesting what you say about Twitter because, you know, I would I would agree with what you say on some level, but then also, for example, I've made some quite, I wouldn't say necessarily deep friendships on on Twitter, but, you know, I have a group of people, we will share each other's stuff, you know, we will support each other when things are bad. And, you know, some of them are people I've never met, you know. Um, so I think for me, you know, it, it's interesting if somebody follows me on Twitter, I go and look at their profile and I'm like, well, you know, who, what kind of person is this? You know, you can tell a lot about somebody from what kind of tweets they share. Is it just their own stuff? Are they sharing a lot of other people's stuff? You know, and, and actually you can tell quite a lot about a person. So then I look at that person mm -hmm. and go, okay, you know, are they actually, what's their, their goal in life of being on Twitter? And then I make my decision from that. And I think that sort of transfers into, into daily life as well. You know, you can look at someone and say, okay, is this person a giver? You know, are they a taker? Do they do a bit of both? And you can kind of... Like the older I get, the more I meet people, the more I know people, the better I get at judging people. You know, are they are they someone who's really going to put a lot of effort in or do they have a, their own agenda? Which, again, is not a bad thing. You know, people who know what they want, you know, but then it, it allows me more to bypass this. I, I can look at someone and go, OK, you know, we, we're not going to have the same motivations in life. You know, therefore they're probably not worth bothering with, you know, yeah, sure. I can give them a follow or, a, you know, a like or something, but, but yeah, it's, it's not, but then, you know, this is one thing that uh, the more I say no, the more I can say yes to the people who really matter. And then, you know, yeah. you, you can form these quite deep, meaningful relationships with people who actually are really trying to make a difference in the world or, you know, trying to make a difference in the world in a way that I can contribute to and make a difference in, which is actually the most important thing. Um, because everyone's yeah, got their true. strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And if I put my my effort where my strengths are, you know, I'm always like, there's lots of different people in the world, there's lots of things wrong with the world and things that need changing. But you know, if you, you should always focus your efforts where you have the most strength. So if you're great at standing up and talking to people in front of big crowds go and do that you know we need people like that you know if you're good at supporting other people in their efforts to stand up in front of big crowds you should go and do that you shouldn't try and stand up in front of the big crowds yourself because you should play to your strengths and so yeah like i always try and make sure i'm very good at supporting other people and you know trying to make them bigger and that's where i focus a lot of my efforts because i'm, like, I'm really good at this mm. So, so yeah, that's going to, I'm going to be happier doing that. And it's going to mean my efforts are worth more than doing things that I don't like doing and I'm unfamiliar with. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I'm, I'm a little bit self-conscious because the way I said what I said about Twitter kind of is, is out of character for people. It might seem out <laughs> of character because people who know me, because I am all about making connections and I am and I'm, I've met friends that I made on Twitter and I'm going to meet friends soon in Portugal that I made on Twitter. Um, but I guess it was more about kind of moving up one level from this interaction, like text-based interaction, tweet-based interaction into, yeah, carrying over into yeah, supporting each other's art and things like that. But Never mind me. Um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> not really the focus here. Um, but I think you know this. Yeah, is, I, this is yeah, yeah. Like the this is the point that you know if you, the more authentic you are, the more honest you are, then the quicker you're going to find people who think in the same way mm. as you do. And you know, because again, I spent a lot of my twenties and maybe even early thirties just being somebody else. So I thought that other people wanted me to be. Um, you know, being trying to be this perfect person. And then I realized a lot of people didn't like me because I was too perfect. <laughs> you know, they saw this kind of person who seemingly had their life all sorted out. And they didn't like that. They were envious. So so you, you can't win. I think you always have to try to be your own authentic self. And 
the more honest you are, the quicker you're going to find other people who, who like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that is interesting about um, the facade. It's it's amazing, you know, how well we know by now that the appearances don't matter that much and how bad we still are at not, you know, in real time adjusting for that and saying it's like, okay, what this person seems to be might not be who they are or what they think of themselves and all that. And we keep falling for that, even though we... I think, know it intellectually. Um, yeah, if we are to to um, to pick up your story again and go through it um, and the angle of saying no because you have to and not out of a place of, of privilege, uh, what's, what, what more is, is there that we can um, think about and apply in our lives um, today? I think, you know, one thing that's, I think, like, it's difficult for me because one thing that I'm very aware of is that, you know, I do come from a very privileged, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm white, I'm, I'm middle class and, you know, I have reasonable amounts of money that, you know, I have a decent job, a day job, I do my writing on the side, but, but my day job pays me reasonably well. I mean, it pays me enough to live comfortably. And so my choices, my, my opportunities for saying no, you know, like I can stand up in my job and say, no, I don't want to do that because I know that I have mm. an opportunity of having another job. If, if that, if it all goes down the pan, you know, then I have an opportunity. So I, I'm quite conscious that, you know, a lot of this advice about saying no, it comes from a place of privilege. And if you're not so privileged, you know, like there are lots of, people who don't have the chance to say no or, or, you know, they face really bad consequences when they do, you know. And actually, this is something I explore in my writing. One of my books is about what happens to a woman who says no to sexual harassment at work, you know. Mm. And I wanted to explore this this idea of, of saying no and, and what happens and the consequences you face when you stand up to someone in a difficult environment. And, and I think it's not always that easy. You know, it's, I can look at my life, you know, I have no, I have no kids, so it's easy. But, you know, if you're, if you're a carer for somebody, if you, if you have, say, an, an aged parent you're caring for or kids or your, your opportunity to say no is much, is much more limited than, than if you, you're like me with a, a reasonable amount of money and, and no dependence. You know, it doesn't mean I don't have things in my life that, that need to be need to be done but it gives me much more freedom so I'm always quite careful to say oh yes you know this worked for me because it might not work for other people and other people Mm. you know if you have if you I mean that's in a way you know that's what unions are for because they help people to stand up to you know you bring people together the more people you have together the more the stronger Mm -hmm. your voice is and the more you you have the opportunity to say no so I think that's that's probably one of my things that I've learned in my life that if you want to say no, you either need the people cheering you on from behind so that you have the confidence to speak out or you need to find other people who can stand next to you and, and give you that sense of solidarity. Yeah, so and now you made me think about something that's very real in my life these days and that is my daughter my four-year-old just basically ordering me around bossing me around and i I really find it interesting it's like not easy to figure out how to how to respond to that and make her be less bossy uh more independent and um yeah, there's no, there's no quick answer. It's like my wife and I both are quite confused about it because you don't want to say no about everything, uh, but you do want to have your um, limits. And yeah, it's unclear what consequences there are going to be if, if you say no all the time because you don't want her to feel unwanted. You don't want her to feel... Um, yeah basically rejected in any way and yeah there are a lot of interesting questions around that um and another thing is 
you know what what do you do if 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 saying no is going to put you in some sort of predicament about money or something like that um are you really going to be more comfortable doing living the life that you sort of want in your head but actually you know you're going to be out of a source of income or something like that and these are really good questions and you know i dare not say that i have answers that are good for everybody and this is actually something that time after time in my life is always hard to deal with right um yeah what what are your yeah, findings and I, I think it? i think kids are interesting because you know one thing i mean it's changing a lot now but when i was growing up you know my my mom was very like she encouraged us she was like oh you can do whatever you want to do with your life and and she never made us feel that you know we were anything less because we were girls and but then you know you get into the real life uh the real world and i mean i'm i'm in my 40s now so going into the world of work and and i came across lots of other stuff and women were really it's it's changing now i think but it's still a big problem and women are really encouraged not to take up space you know so actually your daughter mm. makes me really happy because you know she's taking up space you know and she's pushing the boundaries and and I think this is a really good thing, you know. Um, I think what another thing that was interesting about my upbringing was my mom, you know, in terms of saying no to kids, my mom never said just no. It was always like no because. So there was always a logic behind mm-hmm. it. And then, you know, we'd be like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. You know, so it made this no much easier because, I mean, sometimes we wouldn't agree with her and then, you know, there'd be some kind of argument. But, but you know, it, a lot of the time it would just be like, oh, no, you can't do that because... And then we were like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense. You know, that makes total sense. So so that made the no a lot easier. Um, but, but yeah, I think I think this question of there's never going to be one answer that's right for everyone, you know. And, and you know, some days is not, it's not the day to say no. You know, if you're too tired or, you, you know, there are going to be too big consequences or, you know, it's... It, it's very easy to sit here and go, oh, yes, you should organize your life exactly as you want. But reality is, like I said, you know, the less privilege you have, the the less chance you have to say no to things that you don't want to do. And, but yeah, I think also, you know, we've talked about Twitter and social media. I've seen it used for a great benefit for organizing people, for making contacts, for, you know, for organizing action, for changing people's views, for making people realize, you know, it's one of the things I write books about mental health and people have contacted me and said, you know, I thought it was just me. You know, I I thought it's usually quite, you know, younger people because they haven't, you know, maybe in their teens or early twenties, they haven't, they haven't really got the courage to speak out. And, And yeah, I've had people write to me and say, I'm so happy I read this book because now I know that it's not just me, that other people feel like this. And then they go on, you know, I, I know that they will go on and talk to people about it. And, you know, so I think, yeah, there's all this stuff, you know, ways of finding out that you're not alone, you know, ways of getting help, realizing that your situation is not acceptable, you know, that you should say no to this, you know, but then, yeah, like mm-hmm. only, only you can decide what's best for your life. And, and there's totally no shame in, saying, right, today is not the day I'm going to say no. <laughs> you know, um, I'm going to leave it for another day, another year, you know, or maybe never, you know, because life isn't perfect. So, yeah. so yeah, I think that's also important to realise that, yeah, you, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the person who has their life sorted out because, like I say, you know, anyone who seems to have their life sorted out probably doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's probably yeah. just a facade. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. And it's very interesting. Yeah, I think there's merit in noticing, monitoring your own um, feelings about things. And we want to be able to do things that are uncomfortable, right? So we were talking about relationships. We, We are faced with situations when we're asked to do things and 
if if we just did so instinctually, it would be a no because it's inconvenient on something. Then we might think about it and be like, actually, you know, I can step outside of this plan of mine or something and be uncomfortable, but it's for the sake of something good, of, of really helping out somebody in some real way um, or something like that. And then we might go ahead and do that. Um, so for a lot of people, I think no is in, in some respects the, the easy thing to, do, to say basically anything that doesn't, I don't see the benefit in it from me. We might say no. Um, for other people, the default is yes, and then with a little bit more thought, it could be no. And knowing how to think about things and link together the um, the telos, the the goal with the uh, with the action, is really important because then we don't have to keep this strong default and have have it as part of our personality. It's like, in general, I'm a yay-sayer or a naysayer or something like that. No, I think about each thing in context and then make what I view to be the right decision. You know, we can't promise what the results are in life, but going with what I believe is going to bring about um, good results and going with that and knowing that I... I'm the kind of person who might say yes or might say no. I think that for me in my life, I also noticed that as I got bet better about knowing what is good for me, it was becoming easier to say no and not just not not just say no, but also not apologize in the sense of giving an account, like coming up with an excuse. It It can be such an instinct, you know, it's like, I don't want to do it, so I might... I might um, attach a little light to it as well. Oh, my mom is sick or this person is that or I'm, I have to work early or something. At some point, I think if you know what's good for you, you don't even need to um, to give an account of why this isn't fitting. And actually in a very good relationship full of trust and mutual knowledge, the other person recognizes that, you know, when you can't say yes, you say yes. And when you can't say yes, you say no. And there's less thinking and self-consciousness about, um, oh, you know, what could be the reason? Do they love me? Do they not love me? Um, right? I feel like that's something that comes with uh, self-knowledge uh, and what is good for you. Yeah, and it's interesting that you talk about sort of mutual trust in relationships because... I think that's very, it's a very important point because, you know, it comes back to what I think about is that if you've got a horrible boss, it's not your fault. It's your horrible boss's fault, you know, and in actual fact, there's a lot of focus put on people, you know, mm. people who are quite self-aware, you know, they might be like, oh, I have a horrible boss. I don't know what to do about them. And they go and they talk to their friends and they pass all this horribleness on to their friends and, you know, their friends are trying to help them too. But in actual fact, we should have much more focus on the people who are being horrible, you know, <laughs> not like what should I do mm. if I'm in this horrible situation, but really like, don't be a horrible person. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking to you specifically, but, but yeah, there's a lot of, it's a bit like, you know, the discussions around violence against women and girls, you know, there's a lot of discussion on oh, how can women keep themselves safe, you know, and not so much discussion again, it's changing very slowly, but you know, there's a, not so much discussion around, well, how do we stop men being so horrible? You know? Right. Um, on, and I think it's the same for this, that there's a lot of effort people go into, um, you know, in terms of, well, how can I say no in a better way that will make them feel better? And I'm just like, you don't, it's not your job to make them feel better. You know, it's your job to protect yourself. Like mm -hmm. if you think there's going to be reprisals, you know, yeah, maybe you don't want to say no, maybe, yeah, maybe I, I don't really advocate lying, but you know, if somebody is that horrible that you feel like lying will save you from a horrible tirade of horribleness, then, you know, I would say, yeah, I can totally understand why people would do it, you know? So I think that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of focus on how can I do this? It was interesting. I actually, last week, um, I saw a post from a woman on Twitter who, yeah, she said, 
how can I not write an email saying, sorry, that's not convenient for me without feeling physically sick? You know, so she's wow. actually at the point in life where she wants to say no. She realizes that she needs to say no, but actually it's it's really hard. And there was a really interesting thread because there were lots of other people underneath, you know, posting about their experiences and trying to give give advice. And, and yeah, it, it's the it's this point where you say, well, something's happened to me in the past or, you know, I've had such bad consequences or, you know, just how I've been brought up. Yeah, and it, it's still... It's still out there, you know, people who feel like they can't say no because they've been, you know, they've been somehow conditioned that saying no is a bad thing. So, yeah. yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I'm now I'm with you on my daughter. Now you're making me feel a bit happier that she's saying no all the time, even <laughs> though she never waits for the because part. It's just like a straight. Um, but yeah, and also upon reflection, you know, I recognize that this is maybe not surprisingly not um, not a pattern that I had to deal with. But um, yeah, I'm really interesting to hear from you what it feels like to find that more empowered place in you um do you remember some of the um first time where it was a, a big deal for you to, to stand your ground on something but you did and um yeah what did what did it feel like um i think i think it's It's tricky to think about a specific example. Um, you know, it's been a lot of sort of small examples, just letting letting things slip. You know, I, I tend to just... Yeah, it's, it's always tricky. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm perfect at it. You know, I have things that I'm still doing in my life that I kind of want to give up that I, I don't know how yet. I haven't got the strategy yet for getting rid of them. So I wouldn't say I'm perfect, but, but yeah, I think, I think sort of about three years ago, I changed my job. I was in a very stressful consultancy job, um, managing lots of stuff. It was very stressful. And, and I just turned around and said, you know, no, I don't want to do this job. Yeah, and then it's like, well, how do you get out of it? You know, and it it's actually, it was a relief really to say, you know, I don't want to do this job. What what are we going to do about it? And try to put my focus on how can I get out of it? And it wasn't an immediate process and, you know, um, but to actually say, and I ended up moving into a, a different role with the same company, you know, because I started talking to people and I started doing this mm -hmm. stuff but but I do I do believe in the power you know people talk about manifestation and and all this kind of stuff but I always think the more people you talk to about an idea you know you even like if you want to say no but you don't know how like talking to people and saying I really want to say no but I don't know how you know you're going to get that's already a step towards you know, because you're mm -hmm. going to get people giving you advice, you're going to get people encouraging it on. And, and that, that actually really helped me in terms of, especially with my job, because I started talking to people. And eventually, I found someone who was like, Oh, I'm leaving. So you can apply for my job. <laughs> you know, If that's what you want, you know, then I was like, Oh, this is great. But I, I without all that talking to people about what I wanted, you know, and how I wanted to change things, it wouldn't have happened because I wouldn't have had that conversation with that person. I would have just been like, Oh, I'm, I hate my job. You know, I hate my, and then maybe I would have left to go to another company and, and I, I, you know, something else that maybe, but I, you know, which might not have been a bad thing, but, but yeah, I think you, I do like, if it's a really difficult situation, I do get this physical feeling in my stomach, you know, that this is not a good thing. And it's a very instinctive thing mm -hmm. because, yeah, you're trying to protect yourself against somebody's anger or, you know, so it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do. No, no, it's, it certainly isn't, you know, and when, when I hear about, or 
we talk about situations like that, I'm always placing us in, you know, let's say 20,000 years ago in a tribe of hunter gatherers and thinking about how these kind of dynamics would play out there. And it wouldn't be easy, right? But the fact is that no tribe is completely free of conflict. It is something that is happening. Um, needs are not always going to be aligned, even among the closest of friends or spouses or children or anything like that. And there are going to be those times when we're going to feel this lump in our throat or something in our chest. And yeah, it's, it's going to take some work afterwards to also talk it out with the person and see why the things are not exactly aligned, you know? So it could be because you're just not feeling well that day, or it could be something. I actually have a good example for this. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, that is that is exactly how it's happened. So I have a friend who um, now was looking for a new uh, way to bring in money, basically, and he was unhappy with the kind of work that he was doing, which was manual labor, and wanted to get into making money online, right? And what did he get into is like, affiliate links it's like you know just the weirdest stuff that's just on every web page that i'm always asking myself who's going to click on that like diet pills and stuff right so of course i thought that was a bad idea for everyone because i also thought that he was he was actually the customer not the seller too right because he's the customer of the person who's selling him the dream that he could make the money and so on uh, but he set out to write these documents right for like potential people who are going to buy the pills and um okay well he knows me as, as the guy who knows english and can translate the thing into that and i had to say no and this is a, a, a close friend of mine i just was like no this does not sit well at all with my values I want you to succeed, but I don't want you to succeed in this way. And this is something which I'm, I'm unable to do for you. And it was very interesting. He was not happy about it. <laughs> um, he was not happy about it because who am I to judge him, right? Who am I to judge is like play, you know, the judge here or something. And I was like, it's not about judge. The only person I'm judging for is myself, right? And I'm not going to do that. I was pretty clear about that. Uh, so he was mad for a bit, but it seemed that we have a deep enough emotional bond. But after a while, it's like we didn't have to revisit that. We just moved on. He actually moved on to doing something <laughs> slightly less sketchy. Um, so I so I helped him with that. It was just not as bad as, as just outright lying. And... Um, yeah, so it was it was interesting, and I distinctly remember the the feeling of being there with my phone, right, texting this message, like, "Listen, I can't do it," and not feeling great about it. And I I, I dare say that it worked out as, as well as it could have, but it's it's definitely not easy. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy, and also. But then, you know, you, when you say no, you're coming down to the fundamental decision of do I value my own values more than mm -hmm. the values of this person or, you know, like, or whatever this person's trying to impose on me or do I value my own physical or mental health more than what this other person wants and am I willing to risk my relationship with that person? You know, and there's, sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is no, you know. Uh, and sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah, you have to put it aside and, and accept that you have to do things you don't want to do because you value that relationship more than, you know, but it's, I've been pleasantly surprised by, you know, I worry about saying no, but I've been pleasantly surprised about stuff. Um, but it's also interesting, you know, you used an interesting phrase about, you know, the only person you're judging is yourself because I, I think having these phrases that sum things up you know, I do have these stock standard phrases like, yeah, I'm really sorry, but that's not convenient for me. 
you know and Mm -hmm. there's also other examples like i had some friends who started they started renting out a small flat at the back of their house for for people to come to stay and then they would have people this was quite a while ago they would have people turning up asking to use their telephone you know and I, i for a while it was like well we don't want them to use our telephone because it's expensive, but how do we do it? So, but they came up with the, you know, the, they were like, well, we'd come up with this phrase, like, I'm sorry, we don't offer that service. You know, mm-hmm. and it was like a, it was the stock standard phrase and they took refuge in this phrase, you know, mm-hmm. and, it, and it worked really well because it wasn't like, oh, sorry, it's not convenient or, oh, you know, it was really like, sorry, you know, so it's like this brick wall you put up and, and it's polite, but it's, mm-hmm. you know, so actually, I've developed some of these phrases, not exactly that one, but, you know, things that I will put in an email or, you know, just to, just to put up this wall and say, you know, this is not, yeah. not like, like you say, it's not about you. It's about me, you know, and it's mm-hmm. not convenient for me. You yeah, know? that's, but, yeah, that's a good point. I think in every, in every instance in my life where something like that happened, you know, it was never the case that it was beneficial for the relationship that I exhibit my my internal conflict, which is not always a conflict. It's not always a um, yeah, like a, a very terrible conflict. But th- the feeling is not good to say no to a friend and knowing that they're going to be disappointed and they're going to think about this and that. But you also have to remember that. Um, if done correctly, they could look at you and be like, oh, you know, good for him for not not for saying no. In a way, that's clear communication. And they do that not only because they care about themselves, but because they care about me and they are able to tell me that they won't do it for me. And it could it could give them a new perspective on things and an appreciation uh, for the person who just says no instead of yeah kind of squirming as they do it you know like yes no i feel terrible because <laughs> i also feel like that about relationships sometimes when it's like you know now i'm kind of settled and i don't hear much talk about single people meeting single people but when i did there was this thing where in a few relationships i heard people um, saying that, yeah, we broke up and this relationship is kind of over, but we're still talking about trying to get closure or something like that. Or I want to talk to them to get closure or they want to talk to me to get closure. And I'm like, this is exactly the opposite of closure. <laughs> Do I keep talking things out sometimes? Sometimes if you've come to a decision that the best thing for you is not to be in contact with one another, this is this is closure and the more you try to you know please everyone involved is like you realize that you have a need that you're not going to give up on but you are going out of your way to make them feel good about it what ends up happening is that you're basically kind of a just a fickle person who goes back and forth and sends mixed messages right yeah, and I think, again, it's tricky because, you know, different situations, sometimes there might be kids involved and sometimes you have to be friendly with people that you don't want to be friendly with just for the sake yeah. of other people that you, you care about. So, again, tricky decisions. But, yeah, in principle, I think I would agree with you that, you know, there's a difference between trying to learn from a situation. You know, talk sometimes when, you know, I, I almost feel like sometimes with relationships, when people split up, they start doing the talking that they should have done before they split up, you know, um, about like what people really want. And, and I think doing some learning from that can be a good thing, you know, for your next relationship, you know, why did it to analyze, why did it go wrong? And, but you don't always need the other person Mm -hmm. for that. Sometimes you need a therapist, you know, um, but, (laughs) but yeah, so, so yeah, but I do think, I think sometimes saying no, it can give you more respect, you know, sometimes like I've, I, for example, I work in tech and many times I've been the only woman in meetings and you can see sometimes, you know, most people are perfectly fine, but sometimes it's like, there's just little, 
my career question is like, oh, will you be the one to take the minutes? And I'm like, sometimes I'm like, okay, yes, I can do that. And then I'm like, no, I did it last time, someone else's turn. You know, and, and I can see mm. that gives me more respect because they're like, okay, she's mm-hmm. not just the person who takes the minutes. And, you know, it's like, so, so yeah, I think this, again, but again, it's like picking and choosing your battles, you know. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's always a tricky thing, I think. Yeah. So, uh, in your experience, are there battles that are more likely to, to be, um, picked rather than other ones? Is there a way to figure out in, in real time, what is worth doing or saying no? I think like when I feel like when I was younger, I cared a lot about a lot of things. I would always try and fight every battle and, you know, push the baby and, but things that didn't necessarily matter. And now, yeah, I pick and choose my battles much more carefully, you know, but then also I'm much more outspoken. I'm like, you know, this is 2022. This shouldn't be happening. You know, It's like, so I'm much more, I guess, belligerent. Maybe it's maybe the right word about when I give pushback, you know, I'm just like, how can this still be happening? You know, don't you realize this is totally unacceptable? And, um, so, so yeah, I think, I probably like chosen, I choose certain causes, I guess, that are dear to my heart. And, you know, having struggled as a woman in tech, making sure that the women who are coming along behind me is something that's very dear to my heart, you know, making sure that they're actually supported Mm. and making sure that they don't have as tough a time as I did. Um, And again, that now extends to, you know, I'm finding it's interesting because some of my colleagues, my male colleagues who are taking on caring roles, like they're the, the primary carers for their for their families. It's interesting because they're starting to experience the same sort of problems that the women face, you know, with hmm. if you can't stay late to do work or if, if you, you no, know, you can't swap your days off around because you have to take care of the kids or, you know, they're, they're coming across the same problems, which is interest fascinating for me that, these problems are still there, but they're not necessarily, some of them are not necessarily specifically women's problems. It's, it's caring people's problems, you know, that society mm-hmm. isn't really set up to support people who care for things outside work. You know, it's like, yeah, right. if you can't go off for, for days to go and do work, then, you know, because you have to look after your kids, then, then this is something that's not acceptable. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, the moment I realized that working for, uh, I mean, everything to do with Elon Musk is a kind of a cult, nothing short of a cult, is when I read this memo of his basically saying, you know, if you want to work for SpaceX or Tesla or any of these companies, you know, you basically have to sleep in the office like me because this is how I do it and work until 3 a.m. or something if there's a deadline and do all these things. Like just painting this picture of an extremely unbalanced lifestyle that I doubt could be good for anyone. And, you know, basically telling people is like, here's the filter. If you pass through this filter, is like you can come, you're worthy to, to work here. Um, and this is like a, a very, this is a crazy power move by a sort of a cult leader to say something like that, to set the bar so high and, you know, basically say, say out loud that this is not about uh, individual well-being, but about the success of the company, right? And it was, um, it was very interesting to see and it's amazing to me that people have so much respect, for example, for, for Elon Musk and there could be respect in, in the, in the field of tech and innovation, but it's like, clearly he does not know (laughs) or doesn't care about human well-being, which was very interesting. And basically anybody who came with this, who was on board with this, um, kind of also set themselves up to saying yes, I guess, to Elon Musk in the future because they metaphorically signed the thing. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I find it fascinating how society continues to to glorify these kind of people and, you know, to... Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a big problem in the UK with people being expected to work hours. You know, you get a contract for 40 hours a week, or, but, you know, somehow you're expected to put in this extra stuff. And actually, you're in a way that's almost like like modern day slavery you know that you're you're supposed to you know it, it's 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 very like you say it's very exploitative and it's it's very yeah you know, I, I don't understand how we we continue to sort of glorify this kind of feeling that yeah working long hours and monetary success and you know for me there's so much more to life than this and i i I, I can't understand it. But, you know, I guess everyone has their own values. And, you know, but then I think that's the nice thing that I'm seeing now more, much more. I mean, the pandemic was terrible for so many people, but it also forced a lot of people to have a rethink, you know, and have people say, oh, I, I've been on furlough for six months. I managed to actually spend time with my kids, you know, <laughs> to actually see them. And then they're like, well, this is what's really important to my life. How can I try to make this? And I, I see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of strikes going on in the UK at the moment. And this is really people mm-hmm. trying to say, you know, this is not good enough. You know, you cannot pay us mm-hmm. a small wage, you know, while you sit at the top and earn lots of money. Um, and it's in, I, I'm really interested to see how it goes and where we get, you know, because it's all in the process now. And life seems very bleak at the moment, but but there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. There's a lot of people standing up and saying no at the moment. And I'm really interested to see, I really hope that it changes things because, yeah, you know, the, the, there are things that are not right with the world and, and it, I'm cheering them on, basically. All these people saying no, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just like, yeah, you go for it, come on. You know, and again, I'm supporting yeah, them from yeah. behind the scenes in the best way I can because, yeah, like it's not it's not right that someone should work hard in a job and at the end of the day not have enough money to feed their families. You know, this is just not it's not it's not moral for me. You know, it's not <laughs> it's not right. So so yeah, I'm really excited to see where things go and and what kind of successes they have and. Um, but again, really annoyed that they actually have to fight because, like I said, it's the people who have the privilege. Everyone with privilege, they should be checking themselves and saying, you know, how can I pass my privilege down the chain to people who have less? Um, yeah, yeah. This, I mean, I'm so happy looking at the, you know, millennials are known for being these kind of undependable employees because they might want to move on to a new company or something and gen d gen z the same and i gotta no this is this is good this is good this is um this is the kind of pushback on a societal level that's going to make employers think harder about what they uh, what they really want for their employees, because I think in a world where obedience was almost taken for granted in my parents' generation, stuff like that, they could just be loaded with all these things and all these different tasks and the expectation and there was knowledge that they were going to take it upon themselves and, and deal with it. And if they fail, they were going to be mad at themselves and not at the employer. And now this has this has changed, and I'm happy to see it. So a lot of people will say things like, um, you know, this is this is bad. It's like these lazy lazy bastards are just they want money for doing nothing and so on. I I think that's not it. I think that a lot of the people who do it very consciously give up on a lot of money, and and they give up on a lot of money because they recognize there's. There's more to life than just achieving this status of a successful person. So I'm really interested to see it when the great resignation was a big topic in the news. You know, it was great. I, I love seeing it because this is this is about time. I mean, these people, I don't think any person today basically 
read uh, Karl Marx, but talk about people who are more vocal about the kind of life that they want to to live and you know looking into the eyes of their employers and standing their ground so yeah i'm i'm definitely with you on that yeah but again i mean you know the flip side of that is lots of people are experiencing negative consequences from you know like i mean you talk about them being slammed in the media but but yeah there are lots of people they stand up and they say no you know like people lose their jobs it, it's it, there's still so much to do in terms of mm-hmm. making yep. sure that people are supported in in this this kind of stuff um but yeah you know i, I it's a it's a slow process you, again like i said you just have to put in your effort where you're most suited to change change things and accept that maybe some days like that's somebody else's problem you know it's too big for you to solve or it's not your expertise or if you try to solve it then then you will explode from you know lack of self-care or you know it's it's that i think for me that's the hardest part of saying no you know to look at the stuff and say i could have done something there but i'm focusing on this instead yeah you know, that's the sort of things that keep me awake at night but it, it's the things that i it's been one of the hardest parts of saying no that's to say no this has to be done by someone else because i physically don't have the effort for them mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. that yeah i think that's the hardest part of saying no yeah yeah and another aspect of it is something that i find that yeah when i talk about well i don't know because the great resignation was not just people working in tech and coming from a place of privilege although it's kind of easy to argue i guess if you're a rhetorician that anybody who did choose to say no was privileged enough to say no in a sense so it's it's hard to tell but um yeah i'm thinking now about how do we find the people who actually want to say no and talk with them because i have Uh, people around me where I live and the vast majority of them and I've known them all my life they're like from the place where I grew up the vast majority of them do something today which was not their dream occupation growing up right so and yet if I brought this to their attention there would not even be a discussion, you know, there would just be just like, well, life happened. And then this, this is now our lives. And I wouldn't be making much progress if I was trying to support them in saying no or something, because they're already past the point of even entertaining the, the thought of doing so. So I'm wondering how to recognize people who want to say no, I I suppose they're they're probably the the people who don't do well in school in terms of, um, yeah, just maybe they are still saying no as teenagers and they're getting flack for it. So we might be able to reach in there and maybe pull them out or support them in that space, I guess. I think, you know, one thing that's interesting for me is also people change, you know, you might have someone who dreamed when they were small that they wanted to be an astronaut and then, you know, they end up having kids and they, they, they love spending time with their kids, you know, and that this then becomes the thing that they want to do most in the world. You know, and I, I feel like it's easy to look at people and judge and, you know, I think the only way you can really identify people is by having those conversations, you know, those one-to-one conversations, like, are Mm -hmm. you really happy with your life? You know, like, um and and i think that's the only way because yeah it's easy to look in from outside and say oh this person yeah when we were 15 we dreamed that we would go off and he said he wanted to start his own business but but actually yeah my my dreams when i was 20 are not the dreams that i have now you know so i think yeah it, again it's having these conversations and then trying to best support people in the way that you can you know um because everybody has a different story and and 
everybody you know you can help everyone needs help in different ways you know if you're trying to help them to say no you know the best thing to do is to ask them <laughs> um, I mean some people yeah like you say they mm -hmm. won't have even thought about it but other, a lot of people they have but they just don't know how you know they know that they hate what they're doing but but they don't know how to get out of it so then having mm -hmm. those conversations and opening up and like I say the more privilege you have the more connections you have the more you can put I do this quite frequently you know people who don't have connections I'm like oh you know I can read your CV you know I can do this you know I can put you in touch with this person I know so you can have a conversation with them and talk about what it's like mm -hmm. to do this job and then you can find out if that's what you really want to do because this is something that you know in the middle class privileged world it all runs on connections you know I'm not proud of yep. the fact that every single job I have had I've I, I mean I've applied fairly you know and and got got there through a proper interview process but I've heard about it because of someone I've known you know like someone said oh this job is coming up or this job you know and and so this doesn't make me proud so this is one of the things I really try to do for people to actually pass on this my privilege as much as I can to to the people who might not have these connections and con I'm constantly talking to pushing people to make recruitment policies more fair you know to look at people you know for example for all the, our graduates at the company I work for I'm like do we really need a degree you know or can we take someone mm -hmm. with the college course or someone with lesser qualifications and I'm always pushing them for this kind of stuff to, to try and open up these avenues for people um, so yeah I think if you want to help people to say no the best thing to do is to ask them and if they really seem to be happy with their lives even if it's not what they said when they were 15 then you know just leave them to be happy <laughs> like, it doesn't yeah. like, like our vision you know my vision of somebody else's life and the potential they could have might not be what makes them happy you know I can't force my I shouldn't force my views on other people just my perception of the world no yeah of course of course um yeah not not to say this is as pushback but I, I did notice something different when I was uh, talking with people something else which is sometimes people would say one thing and in a moment of vulnerability and thoughtfulness and um, yeah, t just basically taking a, a deep, hard look at themselves and their lives would tell you something like, actually, you know, I ended up living the life that I didn't want and, and all that. It's, I don't know, I, I don't know if to say often, but it's, it happens. <laughs> there is a case in which maybe 20 minutes later, they would just talk as if this talk never happened. And this, this happened with, to me multiple times with, with people who are just have opened up and I was just going to listen and hold space for them. And then within minutes, they were just telling themselves once again the, the so-called... Um, rational reasons of like no why actually what they do is is you know the the best they could aspire to do and so on so i'm not making a point here but it's just an interesting fact about human psychology how um and this is in effect just uh their inner conflict showing and it's it's rare that people allow themselves to do that but it's amazing to come across the phenomenon yeah, but I think, you know, showing your inner hopes and dreams and your inner thoughts, it's, it's a very scary space to be in, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. then, you know, it, like I said, you know, some days it's all you can do to get through life as it is, you know, without trying to change anything. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's, I think, yeah, like you say, it's difficult if someone expresses a wish for things to be different and then seems to have no interest in changing it but but it's just that they're not at that point yet you know then then i feel mm -hmm. like 
people people will only change things when they feel like the the circumstances are favorable and that they have supported enough to change things so yeah i think it can be quite difficult to you know, yeah because i'm a fixer in life you know i like to fix problems <laughs> you know but you mm -hmm. you can't go to someone and try to change their life you know they they have to they have to be they have to feel like that's possible so so you know it's it's tricky without you know, having a specific example but but yeah that's they really have to but it comes back to what i was saying about support and creating those opportunities for people and you know because it it is a defense mechanism if you feel like you can't change things you do gain some acceptance of it because otherwise it's it's soul destroying so mm -hmm. so yeah i i i'm not surprised at what you say you know because i think yeah it's a it's a defense mechanism but yeah, yeah in terms of how do you best support those people i think again it depends on the individual situation and um yeah but i don't blame i don't blame people who don't want to change the status quo because it's scary to put yourself out there and to change things and you know somebody once said i was trying to to decide on a new job offer that i wasn't sure about and it was a very different job from what i was doing and i said oh you know it's like trying to choose between you know something like two different types of ice cream because i think they'll both be good and he's like well actually mm -hmm. no what you have is you have ice cream it's kind of boring you know it's a boring flavor because you're bored with it but but then you have another box that you're going to open and it could be full of like some amazing flavor ice cream but it could be full of shit mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> so this is what this is what is stopping you from making this choice you know and he's like mm -hmm. do you want the ice cream enough that you're willing to put up with the risk of the shit you know and in that in that case for me the answer was yes because i i you know, what I already had was shit in my current box, you know, so I was yeah. like, well, it's not going to be much of a, but you know, if you have your, your vanilla ice cream and somebody goes, oh, this, this job will be like chocolate chip, you know, but actually, you know, when you open this box, it could be shit. Of course, you know, some people aren't going to go for it. You know, some people will, and some people won't, it will depend on their, but yeah, it's risky risk. You know, I think it is people are very risk averse. Yeah. I'm, I'm risk averse. Yeah, you know, I really have to push myself to take risks. So, so yeah, it, it's um, it's always a tricky decision to to rock the boat. Yeah, I I think that's true. It is it is about risk, and I think that the only thing that truly mitigates risk, and the only thing going back to your mentioning um, connection, the only thing that actually makes um our life actually get much better in many respects is, is the connections that we make for, um, for better, or for worse. Like if we don't have connections and we're just out there taking, taking a chance and going for a, a big shift in how we live and in our job, then it's much more devastating to find shit in the box, you know, for sure. Yeah. Uh, whereas, and I think, you know, if you, mm -hmm. If you have those connections, you know, if you know you, you've got support, you're much more likely to take risks. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you have decent yeah. social security, if you lose your job, you know, you're much more likely to take risks. So it's, it's I think as a society, it's how do we put in those support, all that support, you know, and, and make people have those connections and, and that support network that will allow them to take these risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I hope that um, that we lay the foundations for some future um, talks with people that would prove to be good support. So if anybody listening wants to reach out for um, a conversation, uh, you're more than uh, you're more than welcome to find us on Twitter, right, Sasha? <laughs> yeah, for um, sure. I always like yeah, talking I... about this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Lastly, I, I'd love for you to share any details about, uh, I know that you've written two books, right? And um, 
yeah, we'd love to know where these could be found or where some other um, writings of yours and ideas could be found, found online. Yeah, I tend to share stuff on Twitter, um, you know, in terms of thoughts and, and um, stuff. I mean, I, I, I do occasional podcasts and uh, yeah, but my, my two books, you can, you can order them from almost any bookshop. Um, and there's ebook versions too. So, but yeah, they, they should be available almost everywhere. So whatever your Great. preferred choice of choice of book, book supplier, yeah. <laughs> you should be able to get them. But, um, but yeah. I'll, I'll link to, um, to, yeah, to any resources in the show notes, of course. Yeah. Well, Sasha, I'm really grateful that you said yes to doing this, um, <laughs> and really enjoy the, the conversation. No, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you.